and integration and homoploid hybrid speciation. Okay? And there really weren't any good examples from animals. One of the examples I cited may not even be a good example, and that's red wolf. At that time, people thought it might be uh, in terms of homoploid hybrid species. The 2006 book, I wanted to talk about not only prokaryotes, viruses, and eukaryotes, but also talk about the wealth of different kinds of things that can come about through genetic exchange. And one of those, and that's the reason, this is from the male, okay, uh, in gynogenetic reproduction, sperm is required, okay, to stimulate egg development. During each generation of hybrided genetic reproduction, this one, the paternal chromosomes indicated by that asterisk right there, okay, B, but a la asterisk, are lost, indicated by the egg, egg containing only the A genome, okay? but then replaced again through fertilization with related sexual species. So, the first thing I want to say here is these categories, you have to, nature is much messier than this. These are nice little boxes that we use for definitions. But almost certainly, and actually with genomic information, it's turning out to be the case, and hopefully you saw in chapter six that this kind of schematic in terms of parthenogenesis being a category is too simplistic. Take Daphnia, for example. It's cyclically parthenogenetic. So in really tough times, it may be parthenogenetic, and then at other times, maybe it's not, or vice versa, but you have recombination in those non-parthenogenetic periods of its life history, right? So you have actual sexual reproduction. That's just one example of this. Now, the question came up, and it's a very good question, which is, why don't the males here from this, particularly this other sexual species, why don't the males wise up? adaptively speaking. Why don't they, why aren't they able to detect when the species, when the female that they're about to mate with is actually not going to allow them to have a contribution to the next generation? And the answer is I have no clue. My answer, which is non-gratifying to everybody, is nature's messy and it's not perfect, and, my, and evolution is definitely not perfect. It doesn't perfect things. And the analogy, of course, that I gave you was that the fact that we put, imagine a car where you put water and gasoline and oil down the same hole and expected a valve system to divert them correctly. And you have our, you know, you have what we do with food and water and air. The bad, bad, bad design. Okay, evolutionarily, adaptively, you can say that sucks because the fitness of a person choking like my son did when he was like two or three years old is zero, right, if they're not tended to. So all I'm saying is that that is a nice reflection of and why sports people always wreck their knees because they've been wrong. Probably that one's probably not a pre reproductive age kind of thing, but still, it's a lousy design. So, anyway, all I'm saying is that why these males don't detect, as far as I know, there have been no choice experiments. There's been choice experiments where they try to see which species will do this. Okay, if there's a species complex of like the Pacelia. 
they've, they've done those choice experiments where they say which species will choose this female or this female allow to be the male component, but they haven't really said if you give them, if you present 50 males with hybrid genetic and non females, do they choose right most of the time or never or whatever? As far as I know, there may be experiments out there I'm missing, but so. But, you know, this though just shows you the kinds of diversity of part of the diversity of outcomes from evolution from uh, genetic exchange. Okay, other questions, comments about these three chapters in particular? So the question is, can these male, can, can there be recombination? Or is there ever recombination? The answer is yes. There are cases. That's why I'm saying these categories, there's likely even, I haven't, these gynogenetic, there's probably even leakage there. Okay? So it's been assumed once again, for simplicity's sake and also because we didn't have the genomic tools, it's been assumed that there was no recombination. It was originally assumed that there was no recombination in these parthenogenetic females. But in actual fact, Craig Moritz back in the, he was a graduate student in the same lab I was. He worked on uh, heteronodia and he documented he had good evidence just with alizymes that there actually was probably some recombination going on in his parthenogenetic females, heteronodia the skinks, that when they were dumping those new females out that there, there was some kind of recombination going on. Or it was brand new mutations and since then the genomics would say that it's, yeah, there's a low level of recombination. So. There's no reason to believe, I don't know the data, there's no reason to believe where you don't have the same thing going on in hybridogens and gynogens. But still, the males are still losing out, right? I mean, they're still not, it's not like mating with their own species. Or even a diploid sexual reproducing female from another species. You're still reducing your genetic uh, fitness. Okay, other questions from these chapters, please. Yeah, it's a, gr a great question, and so I'm not, not doing a great job of explaining it uh, then, but what we're saying is that, what I'm trying to say by that, is that if you use, let me just get there, where are we? So when I mean, what I mean by that is if we go back to this panel that, so historically, reproductive isolation was taken as a whole genome, uh, sorry, a whole organism kind of thing. And still you'll see it in American Journal of Botany when they're looking, or systematic botany, or systematic biology, or evolution. You'll see it, you'll see people say, you know, crosses between this and that give rise to F1 hybrids with a certain percentage fertility. So that these species, and then they'll, they'll take each one of the barriers and they'll mount them up. They did this for Mimulus, for example, years and years, uh, not that long ago in an evolution article, where they said if you add up 
then these, you know, the various barriers, flowering time, they give it a metric, and then the fertility of F1s, viability of F1s, blah, 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 and they add them all together, they say they're 99.8% reproductively isolated, okay? So that is using the quote-unquote whole organism kind of estimates. They're not looking at the genome at all. And also, they're doing that to say that the biological species concept works just fine for their plants. And what they weren't reflecting was that those are the exact species that people have been using for, to show reticulate evolution. So let's assume that their estimates are right. That 0.2% is really important, which we would guess anyway. So when I say two sides of the same coin, what I mean is that the fact that this is showing reproductive isolation here in this region. This is below, this is below integration, the level of integration that we would expect, okay? That's reproductively isolated in that region. That is, that is integressing at a higher frequency and than expected. So instead of thinking of reproductive isolation as this unit of stuff, what I'm saying is, that there's one side of the coin and there's the other. And so it's, it's all genome, we should think about it as genomic. What portions of the genome are actually isolated and why, right? So what portions of the genome contribute to the ecological setting of hexagona, fulva, and brevicollis? Because that keeps them isolated but also keeps them adapted to their environment. And if they take in genes, which we know they're doing from the other species to some degree, that linkage disequilibrium that keeps Brevicollis often growing in dry environments, shade, heavily shaded, looking the way it does with its lavender colored flowers, all of those are those loci are in linkage disequilibrium. They're held together. Even though when they hybridize, they may be a hybrid, an advanced generation hybrid that's a back-crossed brevicollis. So they had to pass through a time where the linkage disequilibrium really crashed. In other words, you had a lot of recombination. And then they went through that and st selection pushed them apart again. So that you end up with something that looks like fulva and you end up with something that looks like uh, brevicollis and so that's why I say that we, we need to think about it genomically. We need to think about it at, you know, at that kind of a level. And when we do, we see that that 98.2% reproductively isolated has no real meaning. Because then we have to say, okay, well, what are in these regions that keep it reproductively isolated? What is here? Is that the lavender colored flowers that are always selected for and so you can't get those alleles across? Is it a chromosomal rearrangement that keeps you from having recombination? There's all sorts of things. But it's, it's, that's the thing. It's not an overall organismic reproductive isolation. It's, it's, you know, different regions of the genome are either reproductively isolated or not. And that's viruses, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. So that's what I mean by two sides of the same coin. And I use that intentionally to jar people, particularly those who are biological species concept folks, because they would say, no, they're not related at all. Reproductive isolation is in the business of keeping integration from happening. And my point is, no, they're just, they're just the patterns that you see in the genome. It's an admixed gene. This is a mosaic genome in these back cross ones. Parts of it are there from a different species and parts of it are not. But that's what I mean by that. And let me, one thing I should point out, you don't need, for what I just was talking about, in case you feel daunted by that if you're interested in this, you don't have to have hundreds or thousands of markers to test for mosaic genomes, right? I mean, you really don't. You, you need species-specific markers, but not, you know, you can, do, you can do very good definitions with limitations, but very good definitions of what the genome, 
of looking at for admixture in a hybrid zone or outside of a hybrid zone with a decent set, but not necessarily like this. Because we've built up these markers, I mean, literally thousands of markers, but it's taken us many different grants and many <laughs> decades. Okay, yeah. So the way classically we do that, and people still do that, is to, uh, it's a good question, how do, you, how do you look for markers? <laughs> so there's a pragmatic way, did I do that? There's a pragmatic way, and then there's a way, well the pragmatic way is generally the way we do it. So somebody has a bunch of primers when we're thinking about genomic markers. Let's see if, nope, that's dead. And they have a bunch of markers, we hope. Someone has primers that may work for amplifying the DNA, many different genomic regions. And so we choose universal primers, or at least ones that ought to work in our species. And we try them, right? Now, that's one way of doing it. Uh, it's not the best way necessarily if you had lots and lots of money, but most of the time we don't. And so we use universal primers and we go out, so that's the first thing. So we have some way of amplifying DNA and looking at sequences of something. But what, then you go out and let's say your species are not or your tax are not completely sympatric and let's say they have a distribution like that maybe and that something like that, then what, you what we routinely do, and this has been what we've done, what people have done for decades and decades with different kinds of markers, is you sample in allopatric regions, multiple samples, and you sample in overlap, okay? And the reason that you do that, there's a number of reasons, but this is how, this, if you sample in allopatric regions for these two, then you can get that estimate of 75, 25 or better differences. Okay, and that's what we do, and that's what other people do. So you get away from where they might be hybridizing. They may not be here, okay, you don't know that yet. But anyway, you get away from it and you sample them in present day allopatry. That does not mean you're not de gonna detect hybridization out here, because these things could be overlapping 10,000 years ago. So you have to sample well, get a good idea of what the divergence in allele frequencies are, and then you use those loci if you're looking in here. And if those are nuclear loci now, or as our former president said, nuclear loci, one of our former presidents, um, but those are nuclear loci, right? But it's also incredibly, I argue, for this kind of analysis, really powerful if you'll do, a, you know, a, a cytoplasmic. Because then you can do the, you know, cytonuclear incompatibility in here, cytonuclear disequilibrium estimates in the hybrid zone. In other words, what nuclear markers do or do not pair up with the wrong or the correct. And it really gives you, there's good theory by Jonathan Arnold and the late Marjorie Asmussen from my department who worked out a number of different uh, analytical ways of looking at that cytonuclear disequilibrium and asking questions about selection for, really selection against hybrids, but anyway, you could actually modify it for selection for because we have. Yeah, so of course I'm thinking about plants without sex chromosomes, so I apologize. So the, it is incredibly powerful, just like these two with this. It's also, if you can do, or Y or Z or whatever your animal is, if you can do those kinds of markers, then you can look at 
not only paternal transmission, but you can also ask questions if you have X linked markers, for example, and Y linked markers. I mean, the list goes on, but this can tell you about the evolution of these two kinds of markers, not just in introgression, but you, expect, you have different expectations about how these are going to behave in introgression just like you do here, right? So yeah, I mean, it's all sorts of different things can come out of here. For example, when they were testing where we came from, they started with mitochondrial DNA, so the maternal lineage demonstrated that the root was in Africa. Very powerful study. Okay, it didn't detect introgression, but that you shouldn't, we shouldn't have expected it to, okay? But then they went back and said, well, what about the paternal lineage? Coalesced at a different time, but it also coalesced in Africa. So, you know, if we're looking for points of origin or maybe biodiversification spots of whatever animal, if you have these kinds of markers, it can actually give you some really cool phylogeographic, phylogenetic, I would do a network, but anyway, those kinds of answers. So yeah. But the same thing here, guys, and through all these, you need to sample, I mean, you probably already knew this, but you, it's key to sample allopatrically or somewhere away from where you think these two guys, these two forms may be hybridizing to get an idea of your allele differences, allele frequencies, sorry, in the different species. Okay, other questions? Keep them coming. Say it one more time. So, uh, in the, I think it's in the first chapter, it mentioned that the process of divergence hitchhiking is also quite important. Oh, divergence hitchhiking? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> what we have in a number of, uh, what people have, are arguing now is that a number of characters Maybe I can do this without drawing terrible photos, <laughs> pictures, I mean. So what we actually have to test for is whether or not the loci, and this has to do with that, whether or not the loci that we think are actually under selection are actually under selection. And so, for example, we may conclude, as an example, that the alleles that cause dark coat color that were integrated from dogs into wolves, when we look at the genomic information as they did, as uh, Bob Wayne's group did initially, and they see that there's very low variation at that allele, at that locus, 10,000 base pairs, or whatever they had sequenced. So one conclusion is that selection is that signature of a selective sweep, i.e. reducing the variance looking like directional selection. One explanation is, well, that's the locus of selection, under selection. But the other part of it is that it's actually not. And it's a locus near it, or it's a locus in linkage disequilibrium with it, and it is dragging that locus along. And so this is why it takes more than just that kind of an analysis and looking at phenotypes, et cetera, to actually test 
the, ignore the genetic exchange for a moment. It's always been the question, okay, we know that this locus acts as real tight association with this adaptive trait, but we're not sure it's really that locus and or something a little bit downstream that we're not looking at and the selection goes from there all the way to here. And it's just that locus we had a genotype for, but it's really this locus upstream of it. So that's divergence hitchhiking is something that we can see. And it actually, for sympatric divergence, that's one of the things that people have pointed to as a way for sympatric, that purely sympatric model of ending up with two things from one in the same region could actually occur because then you could actually drag a number of loci along through that kind of leakage disequilibrium and hitchhiking. I don't know. Does that help? <laughs> But that's what it is. That's, that is what I'm referring to in here, sorry, in the book. But it is more general than just genetic, you know, genetic exchange associated events. Yeah. So the question, yeah, the question is, can biodiversity be reduced through natural hybridization or intergressive hybridization? The answer is definitely can. I mean, both theoretically and observationally. In fact, uh, Dolph Schluter, and uh, this is this is something that. Um, Let's see, let me pull some, well, I, I can't, it'll just show it in the table. But anyway, Dolph Schluter recently published a report on uh, human-mediated modification of one of the lakes that he studies for his sticklebacks. And you had the two ecotypic forms, but what happened through eutrophication and or maybe it was the other, I don't remember now. But anyway, they started hybridizing. Uh, those two ecotypes started integrasively hybridizing. They're, they disappeared as a two units. And it actually started a whole cascade through the ecosystem. And so it was not just maladaptive, quote unquote, for them in terms of biodiversity. It didn't, even re it didn't just reduce biodiversity in those two lineages by melding them together but it actually had an effect across the ecosystem. So there, and that's been reported in cichlid fish and the Great Lakes when it gets silted up by human mediated uh, action, as well as eutrophication in the Arctic, uh, sorry, the Alpine lakes and the whitefish. They've seen crashes there in terms of the biodiversity really is reduced to, through intergressive hybridization. So, uh, the short answer is we have good contemporaneous examples of when the, the environment is perturbed by us that biodiversity can, can be reduced. Um, 
we expect that biodiversification can, biodiversity levels will have been reduced occasionally through regular or episodic habitat modification when we weren't around, right? As you disturb habitats or have climatic fluctuations like every 100,000 years, glacier or whatever, the glaciers roll into North America. Um, those kinds of pertur perturbations presumably led to some loss of biodiversity. They also lost, led though to when they receded, presumably increases in biodiversity due to admixture as they see in cichlids and the Rift Lakes. Um, now, on the, this is the interesting thing though that I would ask as a thought question to you guys. So we have the Darwin's finches. We can also think of annual sunflowers. We can think of Louisiana irises. We can think of all the allopolyploids that are out there that have been multiply formed. What do we call it when Geospeza scandens and Geospeza the two finch? Geospeza scandens and Geospeza fortis, which you're referring to. Remember, there was a precipitous drop in genetic dif differentiation as well as beak differentiation. Okay. They did converge. They didn't completely converge, guys. I mean, they're still demonstrably sort of different, but they really converge through natural selection and intergressive hybridization. So when the environment switches again or switched again and they actually were pulled apart again, are they the same species? Are they the same evolutionary unit? And how do we, is it important that we make that we're going to talk tomorrow morning about the conservation implications of intergressive hybridization. So some conservation biology management practices, for example, would say kill every finch on that stupid island and then replenish it with the quote unquote pure species. Of course, the pure species have been intergressing for long, long time since you've had the first finch bifurcation. But we'll talk about those issues. But I guess the question is, what happens when they get pulled back apart? Or when you form an allopolyploid 13 times and you call it the same species? Um, I, I think there's actually, I, that, I don't mean that to be rhetorical actually. What do you guys think? So the GSBs of Fortis and Scandens converge in their morpho did converge in their morphology and genomics. Habitat changes, climate changes, the El Nino goes away, you get a La Nina, and now they're pulled apart again through natural selection. And now they look more like Fortis and Scandens. Do we rename them? Why or why not? I'd really like to hear because I'm still mulling this over and I bring this up in all my speciation courses back in the states and elsewhere. It, it, it's not just as terminological as it seems. So would you, I'd like your opinion, would you rename them knowing, knowing what you know that they really are an admixed lineage, both of them now? Yeah. But would you keep the term Scandens and Fortis, or would you rename them to reflect that they're not what they were before 1982? And then we can discuss that. I, I mean, it really is sort of a, yeah, anyway, I'll listen to you guys. Uh, you can just compare the historic and the present form and um, 
But we really don't generally like as phylogenetic systematists, if that's what you guys do. In other words, you're really interested in, well, character mapping, like we saw today, which was really cool. You know, th those kinds of, you need a phylogeny for that, at least a network, but a phylogeny usually. And if you're trying to character map onto allopolyploids, which are plants, angiosperms, they're actually all polyphyletic. So, and especially neoallopolyploids, like the tragopogon I showed you, you know, it's been in the last 80 years, you've had 13 independent formations, or all these parthenogenetic and gynogenetic and hybrid of genetic, they're all multiple origins. So you have parallel lines coming from the same cross. So what do we, you know, I, it, it's something that we, as a phylogenetics exercise, is impossible, you know, from a phylogenetic species concept, I agree, but it's more when, it, it, yeah, sort of reflects Darwin again, although he didn't know his finches were hybridizing. You know, he didn't understand that the diversity there was based around intergressive hybridization and natural selection, and it was repeated bouts of it. But, but I would go back to your answer about ad adaptations as well. You know, it's, it's sort of a Templeton kind of thing. It's a species concept, but it's also a reflection of have they regained the niche that they used to be in as best we can estimate. Why did I say it's a taxonomic? It's not, taxonomic. not a taxonomic? Well, because once again, they have recognizable features that Peter and Rosemary Grant and experts would say, okay, that's a Fortis and that's a Scannons, but boy, they're very similar. I wonder why. Uh, they're more similar than we expected them to be in terms of their mean variation. So they never melded together completely. Having said that, you, we lost the definition of the morphological phenotypic definition in the cichlids in certain cases, as well as lake whitefish, and then in the sticklebacks and other things in that cascade. And so it, it's, to me, the important part is not taxonomic per se. It's really what are the evolutionary units we're looking at, ecological units, evolutionary. Uh, the, the answer is not for the regulatory elements for the beaks, because that's getting transferred around. But obviously, because you have different beak shapes, obviously the enhancers for the different leading to you looking like a cactus finch versus a different kind of finch, um, different shape of the beak. Even though the regulatory elements are being transferred around, just like the regulatory elements for Heliconia spots on their the butterfly wing spots and in other butterflies too, um, but yes, almost certainly there are. It's a mosaic genome. It, well, it is. It's a mosaic genome. Certain parts are not getting across. But what is considered to be a key element is, in both of those cases i.e. wing spots that make them mimetic and beak shape and size that allow that really tie them closely to environments. So if they have those certain um, phenomena and genes that never get across, would they be more likely to maintain their own identity as soon as the selective that you removed? In actual fact, it's a it's a both and sort of situation, right? So yes. The, the elements that don't recombine islands of speciation or whatever speciation, I don't like speciation genes, but anyway, or speciation islands actually, gives you the idea that they're real small and they may not be. But anyway, in terms of relatively across the genome, they may be huge. 
uh, but just not recombine. But those will, where it's been looked at, including in our, in our system and mosquitoes and, all, and mus, musculus and things like that, dogs, Darwin's finches, et cetera, where it's been looked at, what you see is a both-and kind of thing, so that the introgression of adaptive traits can then drive adaptive evolution in a certain direction, maybe some convergence. But in, when you have differentiated ecological settings, those adaptive traits can lead to transgressive, i.e. new forms, that, all, that actually exploit both the parental as well as a new environment. And so, you know, it's a, but those blocks of material that don't get transferred, that are held in linkage disequilibrium, if they're held in linkage disequilibrium, what that suggests, even through hybridization, that suggests that those are units that are important for the phenotypic expression that we see as GSBs of scandens, at least at some level. Okay, other questions? So in terms of plants and animals, if you have, it's, it is, uh, I gave you some figures here for post-zygotic reproductive isolation in, uh, in animals. And from that, you should be able to see that it really varies all over the place. And so it's hard to give you a, it, it's hard to give you an answer. In fact, it's impossible to give you a, an answer that says 10% or whatever. And the reason is because there, we've talked about it actually just briefly some other time, and that is that there's a real weak, if any, correlation between genetic distance or genetic genomic differentiation, for example, and post-zygotic reproductive isolation, i.e. infertility or inviability of hybrids. So if we look at how differentiated, how many base pairs are different on average between two lineages and then two other lineages. And if this one is more differentiated than this one, it does not mean that your hybrids are going to necessarily have a lower fitness over here. And so that's why I just, people have been doing these meta-analyses, including one of my own former students did a meta-analysis for plants. The correlations are, I mean, they looked a you know, across many plant groups, and they just didn't find a strong. So, you're, uh, let me make sure that I get your question. There's a lot of pre there are many prezygotic, postzygotic mechanisms leading to some restrictions on hybrid formation. And are those, let's use a derogatory term, I suppose, but are those to protect the species uh, or from hybridizing, making a mistake, or are they just byproducts? So it depends on your conceptual frame, not yours, but it depends on a person's conceptual framework. Uh, Ernst Meyer would have said, and Dobzhansky would have said, they're byproducts of allopatric divergence. And that the speciation process equals reproductive isolating barriers coming up, but that, that they're just byproducts of adaptive evolution in allopatry. Um, and so, once again, they were arguing from a whole organism, right? And so when we say there are many prezygotic and postzygotic mechanisms in plants and animals, what we have to recognize once again is that those, every one of those prezygotic and postzygotic mechanisms are porous. So the fact that our pollinators move assortatively, they still move the other way a small proportion of the time. 
the fact that we have gamete competition in animals and plants doesn't mean that we never have F1 formation. Uh, it's reduced with conspecific. The fact that we have lower fertility doesn't mean we never get the next hybrid generation in plants and animals. And that's why, you know, I've drawn up here a number of times, you know, my hypothesis from the genomic information is that the kind of divergence, we don't have tree-like divergence, but we have a network, and that reflects a continual, maybe allopatric, and then sympatric interactions. And so every time these particular forms are brought back in, when the glaciers recede or whatever else, what we see, and this is actually observation rather than hypothesis in many groups, canids, whatever else, is that we're having, yeah, there's reproductive isolating barriers, and as maybe as time goes on, they increase, but it takes four million years or whatever to actually get to full post-zygotic reproductive isolation in mammals and probably longer in birds. And so as we, as this is happening, there's still intergressive hybridization going on. And so that, that's the thing I think we need to remember. Now, whether or not those reproductive isolating barriers are adaptive, you know, the processes are actually adaptive, yeah. Some of them, flower, floral, coloration, et cetera, we know it attracts different pollinators and some are more efficient than others. So there is an adaptive evolutionary element to it. I don't think it's a byproduct per se, but it is, for it to be directly selected for, the only model we have for direct selection for against hybridization is the reinforcement model. So um, the question is, do they have assortative mating going on? Yes. Okay, so when, when we talk about the, let me just pull this up. Instead of doing hand puppets, we have time. So just give me a second. I want to pull up both of these. Um, let's see, India. that. Let me do this to Where are you? Okay, let's start with the oldest data first. The oldest set of data first. So when when I show you this and, you know, said that before 1982, okay, remember this is the GSPs that were on that one small island, but it actually, they were able to look at other populations on other islands in the Galapagos. So before 1982, no hybrids had ever fledged, right? And you did have, though, interspecific pairings, okay? You had them nesting together, mating together between the species, in this case we have three, Fuliginosa, which disappeared and went extinct on this one island anyway, and Fortis and Scandens. So they would occasionally, very infrequently, according to Peter and Rosemary's data of watching these finches, they would have interspecific matings, they would produce eggs, and the babies never fledged, right? After 1982, the fitness of the hybrids was uh, significantly higher for hybrid classes, not even just genomic regions, was significantly higher than the three species. Now, even given that, you still have a pattern amongst these of assortative mating. Okay, it's not just wholesale panmixia of 
hybrids mating with anything that moves, the parents not caring. No, but I mean seriously. So you still have behavioral attributes that lead like phenotypes to choose one another. Songs are still important, you know, the whole nine yards. So there is still a sort of mating going on, even as Fortis and Scandons, that and that, are being drawn together, okay, through this admixture. You know, for the life of me, I can't remember who the babies are listening to. I guess it's the male, but I don't remember. So it depends on who the male is. But yeah, if they're, and Peter and Rosemary looked at this, they actually recorded the songs, both before and after they were doing these kinds of recordings, and I, I don't remember. I know they have named a new hybrid species on their islands, uh, on their island that was an immigrant in, and it was a hybrid, and it has produced a whole genealogy and lineage associated with it. And it, I believe they've talked about the fact that song is playing a part of that as well. But I don't remember in finches, I don't remember in birds. Is it always the male? Of the male, females do of the mom? Yeah, I always forget. I read it, and that's a piece of information that never sticks. I should remember, but yeah. So I don't know. But once again, though, their data on these guys <laughs> demonstrated still some assorted of mating going on. Not perfectly. Here are some back crosses, right? And yes, it could be due to song here in terms of who these F1s sound like or what they want in terms of their, the song they're receiving. Can they whether or not these are genetically similar to their... Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, the new species that they've just named? No, it's a completely, it's a transgressive, it's huge. They call it, I think they actually, I should remember this because I heard them give this talk. Did they talk about this new species? Oh, okay. They gave it at this... Uh, American Association for Physical Anthropologists, they were speaking at the same symposium in April that I did, and they made more sense than I did in terms of being there talking about plants. But anyway, be that as it may, I think they call it the, they haven't named it yet, but they call it BB, which I believe is for big boy, if I remember correctly. And so, um, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing, but it's, yeah, it's evidently it's a magna rostris. There's another, it's a GSP, it's a magna rostris times something else. And magna would give you an idea there's probably fairly big bird compared to everybody else. But is it genotypically like its parents? The answer is, it. I don't remember, it's not like an F1, I don't believe, obviously. It's back-crossed, but it actually immigrated to their, their, migrated to their island they're on. And then through crossing, they have this new form that they believe is, and it's assortatively mating amongst themselves. So they see this hybridization and genetic drift and all these sorts of things or bottleneck as part of that speciation process. Yes. How, 
Oh, has anyone shown variable integration if you change the environment? The only, the only instance of that that I know of where I think the data are very sound, and I didn't collect these data, are the grasshoppers in Australia. People don't tend, and that was under natural conditions in a natural hybrid zone, um, except where they have shown, that's, that's an incorrect statement, because actually there are really beautiful examples of that in contemporaneous and ongoing samples of that in Daphnia. So what do I mean by that? So in, in the lakes in, let's say, Switzerland and Germany, you have these water fleas, and they're cyclically parthenogenetic. And they, they have propagules that get buried in the sediment, sexual propagules that they get buried, or individuals that get buried in the sediment. And they've taken cores, and they've shown that the, the frequency and directionality of integration changes as, you, as the lake environment changes, as they look through time. So actually, that's an example. Uh, and it also affects the degree to the length of the cyclical, the length of, length of the sexual and the asexual reproduction. And it has to do with human-mediated, but even before us, mediated problems in the lake, or perturbations, I should say. Well, the regions that never actually exchange, that part of the mosaic genome concept that, that we've been emphasizing, that is absolutely known and has been known for decades even when we didn't have very many markers. That's why Ken Key proposed that in 68. Um, various reasons, but yes, uh, certain parts of the genome are not recombined and exchanged, okay? And it varies from organism to organism as to why that's the case. In our own, it's linkage disequilibrium because there's not chromosomal rearrangements that are affecting it. In annual sunflowers, it's driven by fertility selection due to chromosomal rearrangements. Uh, it's posited that chromosomal rearrangements between us and chimps drove a lot of the what regions would intergress when we were proto-humans and proto-chimps that were hybridizing. And so there are I can't think of an example where there aren't regions that are tied up. Otherwise, this is, this, is, this is a tension, right, where we have certain regions recombining. And remember those data in the irises where we had 138 or whatever of the loci, I don't know, let's say 138 of those loci were neutral. So they're moving across, they're recombining, and they're they don't look like they're affected by selection, but 85 of them are, and some of those are never getting across in, in our study. So that would almost certainly, if we don't have this tension between genetic exchange derived variation versus linkage disequilibrium, those things holding together we would just always have a panmictic kind of situation, right? And we would lose biodiversity. We would lose biodiversity. And there may be that paper you sent to me, I mean, there may be instances where in certain groups that's, that's the case, where biodiversity is sort of stagnated by intergressive hybridization. Probably are cases of that. Uh, across the board, we don't see evidence for that. Across the board, in terms of domains of life, we actually see diversification throughout the network of life, if you will, and it's associated with genetic exchange. So, But some regions are tied up. That's observation, not, not hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So is that an artifact or a result of those 
So when we have admixture, I guess your question is, when we have admixture, we have intergressive hybridization going on between two plant divergent lineages like Fulva and Brevicollis, we still, even though we have an active hybrid zone, we still, within that hybrid zone, if we have parental types or even phenotypes that look a lot like the parents, we still see assortative mating. And that's in plants and animals. And so, is it a lag? I, I think a better explanation is that what we have, once again, is, is very strong natural selection that is continuing to hold together through linkage disequilibrium pieces of the genome that are not necessarily on the same linkage group. And that what that reflects, that natural selection reflects, are a series of adaptations that are different. Ecological, you know, adaptations to ecological setting, their niches, uh, behavioral, if it's animals. Could be sexual selection as well, so it, it varies from group to group, but whatever the mechanism, it's, it's holding those together. Because we very infrequently see this amalgamation. It's under only certain kinds of habit climatic perturbations, natural or human mediated or whatever, where we actually see loss of biodiversity. So, yeah. But that's what we posit, and what is observed is that you have a relaxation of natural selection or sexual selection in those cases, or both. So, yeah. Yes? <laughs> so, thank you for asking that, because this, is, this gives you a good... Um, idea of how idiosyncratic to some degree our careers can be. I was in Australia for six years and I was working on animals. I ended up knowing, I thought I was going to stay there and then I couldn't because of, uh, uh, well, unhealthy family members, uh, parents, so we needed to come back to the States. And I had worked on groups of sunflower, well not sunflowers, but sunflower related things, so in the compositi, Asteraceae. And I had read a lot of Charlie Heiser's work, and this was in the late 80s, and I knew that about all these hybridizing sunflowers, and I wanted to work on, on something like that, annual sunflowers. So anyway, I, I isolated, because I was doing molecular work then, I isolated the whole ribosomal RNA cistron, which was a commonly used molecular marker at that time, from Helianthus argophilus. I isolated DNA from a bunch of different species, brought it over with me to the U.S. and was getting ready to work on that. I was at Louisiana State University as a postdoc and I was, it was announced that this guy named Lauren Reesberg had done everything I was thinking about plus a lot of other things during his Ph.D. So I contacted him and he, sure enough he had done a lot of stuff that I had been thinking about so I just mailed him that and then I was looking, I mailed him the ribosomal RNA marker, he was very grateful because it gave him a homologous marker. We didn't have PCR then going. So anyway, so then I'm at LSU at Louisiana and I'm wondering what the heck am I going to do for a job talk uh, now that I'm not going to do Helianthus species. And I had read a book by Edgar Anderson called Intergressive Hybridization as an undergraduate and I'd done a book report on it uh, for my mentor. And his first chapter is called Typical Example of Integration, and the typical example were the Louisiana irises, Iris fulva and Iris hexagona. And I ran into a postdoc who was actually working on them there, doing ecological studies. And he and I paired up. Uh, I got a job at Georgia. I hired him as a postdoc, and that's where it all started. So, and, and having him there as an ecologist, because I couldn't even spell ecology at that time, still have trouble with it, um, you know, really moved us into the ecological, evolutionary ecology kinds of stuff. But, so I did know that they hybridized, but I hadn't thought about them in terms of working on them until 
the other thing tanked. So, yeah, it's that's one of the reasons to read literature, but read old literature too. You know, a lot of times you run into examples and you go, nobody's touched this. Wow, I wonder why not? Because nobody had worked on Louisiana irises since uh, mid '60s, and so, but there was all this beautiful work on distributions and ecological settings and all that that had been generated in the 30s, 40s, up to the 60s because of the original report I mentioned to you guys, I believe, about the New York Botanical Garden folks coming down and naming 80 species, or well, over 80 species of Louisiana irises from Louisiana. And it was because they kept picking up different phenotypes which were hybrids and just naming them a new species. And so that generated a huge amount of work for about two or three decades. But then nobody was doing anything. So we were able to come in and immediately start testing all these old hypotheses about integration, hybrid speciation, all that, and nobody else had looked at it. So I just encourage you, well, Heyman and I were talking about one of her systems. I mean, you know, you ran across it in the literature. And it just, you know, if you read the old literature, it's such a good thing to do, and I know, yeah, when are you going to find the time, but if you have an idea of something, an area, or region you want to work in, read the old literature, because you probably will run across hypotheses that nobody has tested, you know, not tested the way we can test them now. That was it. Now, we've worked on all sorts of things, birch trees, fire ants, my first PhD student who's a distinguished research professor at Penn State, worked on fungi. A lot of stuff I didn't know what, you know, what in the world it was on. Columbines with Scott Hodges, Pirakisa with Mitch Cruzan. So we've worked on a lot of things, but the irises have been the central. They've been what we were funded for. <laughs> and then we just sort of shuffled money from that. Used to, you were allowed to do that. Now we can't really do that so much. Okay, other questions? Oh, please don't make me stare at you for the next 20 minutes. Yes. <laughs> Bless you. Yes. So chapter two. Mm -hmm. So you you have mentioned that they changed the gold standard from DNA DNA hybridization to average nucleotide identity to uh, describe new prokaryotic species. So so they mentioned that uh, uh, around ninety five to ninety six percent uh, ANA threshold can be used to demarcate two two species. So how did they arrive upon this? Yeah, so it's a it's a barcoding exercise, right? So they have they go through and not that I believe in barcoding that barcoding always gives us this kind of demarcation. Plants are harder than animals, for example. So but in bacteria what they what they did was they already had a barcode based on reassociation kinetics, DNA DNA hybridization. And so they looked at those individual, sorry, they looked at those lineages or those species of bacteria, prokaryotes, that had a, a range of DNA-DNA hybridization amounts. And when they sequenced the ribosomal RNA, they said, okay, if you have this amount, which we used to say was a new species, you will have this amount of ribosomal RNA divergence. And if you have this amount of less than that, then you're the same species. So that's how they did it. They just did a comparison of what they'd already done. And they just, it's, once again, it's exactly what we do with barcoding, really. Well, because it's, it's directly based on a sequence, right? And so DNA, DNA hybridization, sorry, sequence of a specific region. 
DNA-DNA hybridization is the entire genome, right? So when we talk about DNA-DNA hybridiz or DNA hybridization, what we mean by that is that you have a helix, right, and you've melted it, you've heated it up, and you've that gets pulled apart, right? Your double helix is pulled apart. And so for DNA hybridization, which I've done before, so you have one species or one things separated out, and now you take it, and all you have using various kinds of methodologies, basically snap freezing this, you keep these away from one another, and you have single-stranded for this one type. And then you do what's called, you put in a driver in a lower frequency, and you ask how long it takes this divergent strand to uh, anneal, back anneal to this. And what you end up with is a TM, so it's a, it's a cut curve, and you use the 50%, it's just the TM, Okay, it's called the TM. And that is where 50% of your molecules are re-annealed. And so that TM will decrease with greater divergence. So if you have no base pair mismatches, your TM is going to be very high, okay? In other words, it's going to take a lot of temperature to melt you apart. Whereas if you have two very divergent prokaryotic species or bat species, we were working with bats when we were doing this, and plants. We used it in plants as well. If you have very, two different, very different genomes, when you put them back together here and melt them apart, they're going to melt at a very low temperature, right? Because they're not bound well together. So that's where the TM is. But that's the whole genome that's actually been fragmented. I show it as a complete thing, but it's been chopped up into little bits. So the, but the new, like you said, gold standard that I use that terminology, the new gold standard is that they use ribosomal RNA. And they use that as their <coughs> molecule of choice for sequencing. And the reason they do that is that it doesn't, for whatever reason, and they really haven't figured this one out, okay, but for whatever reason, it's one piece of the genome that is not transferred horizontally between prokaryotes. So that's why they use it. Yeah. So is, there, so is there higher probability of horizontal gene transfer between organ, uh, members of the same clade versus different clades? Yeah. There's a debate as to whether or not you can even draw a prokaryotic tree, right? I mean, you have different camps that argue you can't even draw because it's not realistic when you have so much of your genome moving around that the evolutionary history is the genome moving around rather than vertical transmission. And so um, that's one issue, and I, I really don't... The frequency of successful horizontal gene transfers, we would expect there to be some correlation in terms of closeness however, similarity, however we want to estimate that. But it's so autocorrelated with the fact that they, if they're, high, if they're very similar, they're probably in the same environment, and you know what I mean? And, and so we see very different kinds of prokaryotes exchanging important loci. And they, they refer to it basically as a superpopulation around the world a lot of times, whole clades, and so 
I don't know how to answer that. I, d I think that it's, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what the answer is, I guess, is what I'm saying. Is it more frequent? Well, it's sort of like the meta-analysis of does genetic differentiation, amount of genetic differentiation correlate with the likelihood of hybridization or integration? And the answer is it's not real strong. So I don't know. They haven't, they need to do more experiments in prokaryotes. That's what I am emphasize in the book. There's some experiments that have been carried out. Exper in other words, to test the fitness, quote unquote, of prokaryotes when you shove genes into them. Because you never get the idea in nature and science papers that come out almost every week. When they're, na when they're showing a new organism, prokaryotic organism, and talking about the stuff that's there, and they say, well, this is horizontally gene transfer, a horizontal gene transfer event, and it's very important for adaptation X. But they never tell you or never discuss, how, is it one out of 1,000? And, and 999 were unsuccessful? I mean, that's really important. One out of a thousand is a huge frequency. I realize that. Or is it one out of ten? So I really want to know that. This is this mosaic genome kind of thing, but at the prokary with the prokaryotes. I want to know which pieces of the genome really can't transfer besides ribosomal RNA. And maybe the answer is everything else can transfer. I'd just like them to tell me, tell us, and explain why. Okay, other questions? We're getting there. When I get back to the hotel room after one of these sessions like this, my wife looks at me and says, you really don't have any voice. I'm like, glad I'm using a microphone. <laughs> Usually I'm shouting. Any other questions? Yeah, so um, there is some suggestion, some <coughs> evidence that metabolic genes are less likely to be transferred in bacteria. And then you turn around and you find out that whole pathways have been transferred. Huh? Yeah, but it's, yeah, I know, but these are not linked. Right? I mean, we're talking about horizontal gene transfer events, yeah, that are not, they're not next to one another, right? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, they're huge complexes of genes. That's what flabbergasts me because you, and I was talking to somebody at Pune about this. She's working on the evolution of these different pathways, and I actually put her on to Suter. I, I told them that I was the one who introduced them, but I said, look, this is the kind of modeling that Sudarth does, uh, that you want done. Is, so anyway, when we went down, it's the idea of these, it's almost a behavioral ecology kind of question, model, but it has to do with genome and its movement and its flux. And so anyway, I think they're, they're going to get together and work on this. I told them they have to put my name on the, no. So, um, how the heck, and that's what I was saying, she said, how can this work like this? They're not, they're not linked, you know, they're, they're different and they're in different regions and, but yet it looks like it's a horizontal gene transfer. Can't be piecemeal because it wouldn't work. They know that. If they piecemeal it, it's not what, you know, it's not the idea that a lousy eye is better than no eye at all. You would have no eye at all if you just transferred a little bit of it. So it has to, you know, I don't know. Nature is unpredictable. <laughs> I sound like a PBS special. Oh. 
Okay. Thank you, guys. And tomorrow morning, I will be finishing up. You guys will be so happy. And then we will uh, 